morning. Thanks for joining us today. Why don't you come stand and worship with us? Promises in fulfillment. 
Let's sing that together.
living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is on.
you give us open hearts and open ears to hear everything that you have for us today. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us. We're going to get started shortly, but before we do that, would you turn around and introduce yourself to somebody? church good morning church there we are it is great to see everybody thank you for joining us and worshiping with us today if you're online today thank you for joining us online today we're just so glad to be able to worship God together we're going to get started and uh, we just uh, have a lot of announcements to go through so we're going to try to go through these as quickly but efficiently as possible. First off, today we have a class called Discover CGS and this is a class for anyone who is newer to the church and might would like to know more information about the church. It's a great opportunity for us pastors to get to know you a little bit better and uh, so if you signed up for that today, that is right after church today and uh, what you're going to do is you're going to go all the way up front and that is the CGS Kids Church room and we'll have tables there. If you are new here today or you didn't get a chance to sign up, we will have plenty of food for you. So just find yourself uh, walking straight up there. Food is on us today. So uh, enjoy a meal and uh, get to know us and get to know a little bit about the history of the church and everything. So that's going to be a great uh, class today uh, right after church. Uh, coming up May 2nd is then the second establishment of the of this uh, class. It's called Discover Membership. And this is for those who would like to become members or explore what it looks like to be a member of the church here. And, uh, and so uh, there is a sign up for that. We will also have a lunch for that. Uh, would you be kind enough to sign up so that way we know how much food and uh, how much child care to provide and all that stuff. So uh, that is also coming up Sunday, May 2nd. Uh, we have a couple different small groups tonight. Uh, we have small groups throughout the month. Small groups is a great way to make big church feel small and build relationships and study the word of God together. And uh, so tonight we, uh, Pastor Brad and Cheryl, they have their small group, and they also meet at the CGS Kids Room uh, at 6.30 tonight. And also during that time, we have the Point Man Youth Ministry uh, small groups. We meet in the uh, youth building, which if you're new here, if you drive all the way around back, you can drop your students off there, and they will find their way right into the youth building. That goes from 6.30 to 8 o'clock, and uh, Meals or snacks are provided at uh, all those uh, small groups, so we would love to have you come and join a small group tonight. Uh, coming up on April 19th, 21st, and 23rd, we have the Fostoria Sharing Kitchen. This is a, a great outreach that, uh, that we've been blessed to be able to do over the years, and it's a great way for us to be able to give back to those who are maybe struggling a little bit financially and need meals. And uh, so from 8.30, is that right? 8.30 to about 10.30, uh, we serve meals at the Foster Ray Sharing Kitchen on uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the 19th, the 21st, and 23rd. If you would like to be able to help out with that, there is a sign-up sheet for that as well as at the Welcome Center. Welcome Center is just located through those doors a little bit to the left. Big sign that says Welcome Center, and there's all kinds of sign-up sheets there for different things. Uh, so that is the Foster Ray Sharing Kitchen. Coming up this Wednesday is another Wednesday night family night. Uh, there is something for all age groups. There's a nursery, children's ministry, youth ministry, adult classes, a class just for ladies. And uh, we meet from 7 to 8, 10 every Wednesday. And uh, it's just been going really well. And if you haven't been a part of it, we'd love to invite you to come and explore what a family night looks like uh, each and every week. Uh, we're going to get ready to take up our offering, and there's several different ways that that looks like. If you're in-house, there are baskets at the back tables, and you can drop off your tithe and your offering there. You can also uh, use the Church Center app. You can download that on your smartphone. Super easy to do. You can text 84321. You can text your tithe and your offering that way, or you can go online at cgs.church and click on the giving tab there. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. God, we thank you just for the beautiful stretch of weather. We thank you for the rain that we've received. Uh, God, you've given us so much. And so, God, now we want to give back to you. And so, God, we ask that you take this offering, Lord, and to use it to further your kingdom, to do your work all across the world. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
Well, good morning. morning. It is good to see you this morning. If you are a guest, uh, thank you for being here and visiting with us. Uh, This morning, if you are watching online or in our overflow space, thank you for uh, tuning in as well. My name is Brad Keen. I am the lead pastor here, and uh, we're just excited. A lot of great ministry, a lot of great things coming up, and so we're looking forward to seeing what God is going to do uh, in the upcoming months and the rest of 2021. All right, we're going to begin with a time of prayer, and before we do this morning, just remember to uh, keep those in our church family that are in need, or we've had many people lose some loved ones lately, so just continue to uh, keep them in your thoughts and in your prayers. Keep um, uh, Karen Sharp and her family in prayer. We had uh, Doug's uh, service here on Friday. Keep John Mills uh, in your your prayers. Uh, His mom's service was Thursday, and then keep uh, Terry and Judy Robinson and Pastor Jeremy Alicia and the kids in prayers as her dad's uh, funeral is this Tuesday. So uh, all of us have lost a loved one at some point in our life. And uh, it's just something that allows us to go through that when we have the encouragement and the love and the prayers of other people. So I just want to encourage you guys, give them a a note of encouragement and uh, just be praying for them. Let's go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And God, we're, we're so thankful for... Um, just uh, the the rain, Father God. We're thankful for the sunshine. We're thankful for the seasons. And uh, God, we pray that you just be with all those that are just uh, going through a season and a time of loss in their lives. God, we're so thankful that you comfort hearts, God, that you help us through our times of of mourning and and grief. And Lord, we just pray that you'd uplift uh, all these family members, Father God, that you would keep them um, just help them to, to stay strong in this time, Lord, that you'd comfort them, that they'd sense your love and your presence. Lord, we pray for all those that are in need of, of healing. God, we pray for uh, just whatever the need is. God, we're so thankful that you meet us where we are at. And so, Lord, we're thankful for that. Now, God, we ask you to open our eyes, that you'd open our ears, to be receptive, be ready to, to hear your words today. God, that we might leave here changed in some way, Lord, that some nugget of truth from your word would grab hold of us today and make a difference in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, last week, uh, what, a, what a great time to just be together. The church was full and have Easter service together. And, you know, after coronavirus last year, and then, you know, now having Easter this year, it was just great to be back together again. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking about that uh, this morning and throughout the week, I get little things that pop up on my social media f- feed and it's, you know, a year ago, coronavirus, this was all new to us, and now we just can't wait to get through it all and to walk around without a mask on and all of these types of, all these types of, yeah, the amens are going off. Uh, you know, just to be able to kind of get back, and we're slowly kind of doing the, the things that, uh, that we want to do, but it was just so great uh, to be together and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together. Well, this morning, we are going to start a new series, and it is called Guardrails. And I don't know what your mind goes to right away, but I hear the word guardrail. I think of those metal barriers, uh, you know, on the sides of a road. Uh, you know, guardrails protect us. They keep us safe. They, they stop us if we hit one from going into uh, the dangerous areas in our life. And so you see them on the sides of the road to protect us. And we need to have barriers and protections in our life as well to keep us on track so that we don't go into the ditch. Have you ever proverbially gone into the ditch in life? You know, I mean, there's sometimes, I always tell people, life is like a two-lane road. You don't even have to be in the right lane, just stay on the road and stay out of the ditch. You know, sometimes we get off track, but we need to uh, stay out of the ditches in life. And I think it was like six or seven years ago, I talked about this, this topic of guardrails here at the church and I and, uh, wanted to come back to it because there are so many different areas in our life that we need healthy boundaries in. And uh, guardrail is just such a great uh, imagery in it. We could probably, you know, spend the next, you know, 10, 12, 15 weeks talking about just different areas in our life scripturally where we need some healthy boundaries, where we need some healthy guardrails to set up uh, some protection for us. And so it's one of the most important things that we can do in our life is to have healthy boundaries. So whether it's on the road or whether it's in our life, 
Guardrails prevent us from going into dangerous areas. Again, we'll see them on a sharp curve. You'll see a bunch of guardrails. Or you'll see them as you're traveling down uh, the tollway. Before you get to a bridge, they'll have guardrails. And I don't know, whenever I travel the tollway, it always seems like there's a road crew fixing one of those guardrails. Have you ever, you know, encountered them? And they're out there and they got the road, the, the road closed or the cones out on the, on the one side. And they're fixing those guardrails that have been hit. You see them on the medians uh, on a major highway in between the lanes to protect cars from going into oncoming traffic. You know, I grew up on the Mississippi River. I grew up in a little river town called, well, that's about, not too little, I guess about 30, 35,000 people. Uh, that's a little town where I came from. We're the, the, little, the little town. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area, those were the big, the big cities, St. Cloud, but, you know, Hastings was just the little, little, little river town south of, of the big cities. And uh, in, our, in our little river town, we grew up right on uh, the Mississippi River, and there's huge river bluffs. Um, along the river, and a lot of those have some big, beautiful houses and things on it. But to go north out of town, which is something that uh, we had to do almost every day of our life for the 18 years uh, that I grew up and lived in this town in Minnesota, you had to go over uh, the Hastings uh, River Bridge to get out of town. You had to go over the Mississippi River. It was really no different than going over a railroad track in northwest Ohio. Um, that's pretty much what it was. And there's a picture of the new bridge they built, oh, probably about a decade ago. Uh, uh, that, that's, the, that's the bridge that we would have to travel um, every day. And you can actually see, just so that we're all, you know, can identify with this, that's a train bridge, the small one in the back there. It's uh, behind that. So they had a, they had a, a train bridge as well to span uh, the Mississippi River. And uh, so, again, just like going over railroad tracks here, we had to go over uh, this big river bridge almost every single day. And that bridge has some big guardrails on it. It's hard to see from this picture, but you need some big guardrails on the side of the bridge because sometimes there were accidents on the bridge. And I can remember a few times in my life where the word would get out that the bridge was actually closed. Now, in order to get to the spot on the other side of that bridge that's just five minutes away, you would have to go west out of town and go all the way out of town and make a big loop back around, and it could take you 45 minutes to an hour to get to that place that was just five minutes away on the other side of that bridge. But when the bridge was impassable, there's nothing else that you could do but take the other way around town. I can remember my mom getting stuck at work sometimes on the other side of the bridge and have to take the long way home. Anyone else get a song just went off in their head when I said that? Um, not sure why that happens. Take the long way. All right, so that's what we had to do. But anyways, the guardrails keep the cars from falling off into uh, the river. And so from taking something that is a bad situation and potentially turning it into something tragic, uh, a bridge has guardrails on it. See, guardrails are designed to direct and to protect us. They're not there to harm us. They're not there to inflict damage on our cars. And if we do hit one, uh, you know, you shouldn't be mad that you hit the guardrail and it damaged your car. You should actually be thankful that that guardrail was there in the first place. So when you look at guardrails in this picture that Pastor Jeremy has here, you can see guardrails uh, on this windy bluff road as well. Uh, there's some interesting things about guardrails when you actually step back and you take a look at them. First of all, the guardrails are not actually placed in the area of danger. If you look at this picture right here, the guardrail is still inside that danger zone. So in theory, you could be driving closer to the edge of the road or walking closer to the edge of the road because that guardrail is always inside that safety barrier area. It's not outside of it. Uh, you could you know, drive closer to the edge and still be fine, but then you'd really be playing with dangers if you're not playing with danger enough, if you're getting close to that guardrail. You know, the whole logic behind having a guardrail on the road, the whole logic behind having guardrails in our life is that the damage that is done by scraping into or hitting the guardrail is a lot less than what would have happened if that guardrail was never there in the first place. You know, car repairs are never fun. I've had to have a car uh, fixed a couple different times in my life, and it's a pain, uh, and it's a hassle, and it's never fun. But it beats the alternative to not having a guardrail there uh, in the first place. Anyone ever hit a guardrail? You don't have to raise your hands. But, uh, I thought that'd be an interesting. A couple people. All right, yeah. 
Um, you know, a couple people have hit guardrails. I've never hit a guardrail. I've, you know, I've hit a deer and some things like that. But, uh, you know, guardrails will mess up your car uh, if you hit them. But, again, the damage done to your vehicle is a lot less than if that guardrail was never there to begin with. And so in this series, there's a couple things that we're going to look at. We're going to look at having healthy guardrails for our life. And so as we go through this uh, series the next four or five weeks, uh, whatever it turns out to be, we are going to hopefully take a look at our life and evaluate our life and find out where are some areas that we have some guardrails already in place. And if we have guardrails already in place, do we need to strengthen those guardrails? Do they need to be bigger? Do they need to be stronger? Have they been, you know, hit one too many times and we need to repair some of those wood posts, uh, you know, if you think about it? Or what are some areas in our life that maybe we've never set up some healthy boundaries? We've never, we don't have the barriers in place that we need to. We kind of keep slipping over into the edge and going into the ditch in life. And so we need to set up some healthy boundaries and barriers. So we're going to take a look at those things. Uh, and by doing that, I believe it's going to help us to be able to live our life in the, for the Lord in a more fruitful manner and to live our life in a way where we don't have as many regrets. You know, there's the saying, live life with no regrets. Now, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I'd be interested to hear them, but I don't know that that's true. Anyone think you can live life without any regrets? I mean, I'm 45 years old. I don't know if I got another 45 years in me or not. We'll see. Um, I woke up this morning with a kink in my back. You know, I just woke up and I was hurting. Uh, but, you know, you know, it says, say, live life with no regrets. I don't know. I have some regrets in my 45 years of life. You know, there's some chances that, I've, that I didn't take that I wish I would have taken. Anyone have any chances that you wish you, you know, in the moment they look like, wow, how could I possibly do that? Then you get on the other side of it and you're like, why didn't I try? What's the worst that could have happened? I could have failed at it. But it's so easy. Life sometimes seems so big in the moment, but then you step back from it and you get back from it. You're like, wow, why didn't I give it a shot? Or, or maybe there was a, uh, a, you know, a friendship that, you know, was ruined because of a dumb reason and you allowed pride or whatever to get in the way and nobody apologized and then you, you moved on from it or, you know, maybe, maybe it's an argument that you had with a spouse or, or with a child, but there are regrets that sometimes uh, we have in life and a lot of times they have to do with the decisions that we make though where we can have, uh, have regrets. Sometimes they're for the dumb things that we did in life. Now, I know nobody in this room has ever done anything stupid, so we're just talking to everybody watching online or something. I'm just, just kidding. Uh, but, you know, that's a lot of times where our regrets come from, from the dumb things that we do in life. Maybe we took a stupid bet. Uh, maybe we took an unnecessary risk. Or, you know, maybe we got a tattoo from a tattoo artist that doesn't know how to spell. Like this lady right here, no regrets. Or the next one, no regrets. So I'm not a big tattoo person myself because uh, if I got one like six months later, I would want to change it, you know. Uh, some people are really into them uh, and, and that's fine. But just make sure you have a tattoo artist that knows how to spell. Uh, other, otherwise, that will be one of your greatest regrets in life is that you had a tattoo artist that didn't know how to spell. Now, that's just, that's just silly, and that's just, you know, something funny. I guess unless you're the person that had that done, then I guess that's not funny. You have to live with that the rest of your life. But the truth is, uh, the greatest regrets in life oftentimes could be prevented if we had better guardrails, we had better boundaries, better protection set up in our life. You know, it could be in the area of our finances, in morals and values, uh, in relationships, uh, in, in, in our professional life, to have guardrails in place, uh, maybe even guardrails for your health, guardrails for your time, guardrails for diet and exercise. Do you see what I'm talking about here? If we don't look at those areas and we don't set things up, it's easy to go off the road. It's easy to go into the ditch in those areas of your life. Like I said, if we started looking at all these areas and taking a look at the major areas in life, we could, we could talk about this for a long time, but I think that we'll all get the point as we go through this series and identify these different areas in our life where we need these healthy boundaries that God will guide us through in Scripture to establish. And one of the challenges that we really face is that 
we live in a world, we have a culture that really doesn't promote having healthy guardrails. I'm not sure if you've noticed that. Um, you know, watch TV, listen to music, uh, watch commercials during the Super Bowl with your family. They're always fun to watch, but I don't know if you've ever found, if you're a parent, going, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just watched that with my child. Um, you know, that is what culture is throwing at us. That is what culture is promoting all the time. And, and uh, instead of having guardrails, it's kind of like the analogy, culture kind of has that little painted line on the edge of the road. And, uh, you know, like, for example, here in Ohio, how well does that work with those deep ditches with that little painted line on the edge of the road? It doesn't stop you from going off into these big uh, ditches, which this morning as we, as we woke up were filled with water from the rain that we had last night. Uh, there's no guardrail to actually stop you from going off the side of the road and having an accident. For example, some uh, culturally painted boundaries, uh, we say things like parents... Uh, talk to your kids about drugs. Yeah, just, just have a conversation with it. Just talk to your kids about drugs or sex. Wait until you're ready and then be safe. That's a culturally painted boundary. Uh, money, consolidate your debts, right? Not, don't get into debt in the first place. Just put them all into one spot. You know, just get them all, get that interest rate down and consolidate them into one spot. Or alcohol, just, just drink responsibly. And if you are going to get drunk, make sure you have a designated driver. Right? That's what's promoted in culture. That's an example of a painted uh, boundary line on the side of the road. And because these thoughts are really prevalent in our culture, they're all things that we've, that we've heard people say or maybe we've said them to ourselves, they really, don't, they really don't alert our consciousness when we brush up against them or when we begin to hit them. You know, nowadays they got those little rumble strips in some areas on the, on the side of the road. So maybe it gets your attention uh, a little bit quicker, but there's nothing to really prevent you from going off into these areas uh, when we, uh, that, are, that are dangerous in our life when we begin to brush up against them. So we need something stronger than just a painted line in our life. So let's take a look at scripture. We're going to take a look at Ephesians chapter 5 this morning, uh, verses 1 through 20. We're going to take a look at what Paul says here in Ephesians, just about life in general. And there's, there's a lot that's here. I could probably spend probably the next two to three weeks just unpacking this one passage alone. And we're not going to have the time to do that. We're just going to go through this passage uh, this morning. So pay attention and uh, feel free to go back on it and read it over. If you have any questions during the week, throw me an email or a text message and I'd be happy to talk with you more about it. So Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, Imitate God, therefore in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord, so live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot there. And uh, just a great, I love the book of Ephesians. 
Um, honestly, we should just do a series on the book of Ephesians and just go through uh, this book uh, verse by verse. It's just a, it's just a life transforming uh, book of the Bible that just gives so much truth for our lives and how to, how to live for God. So Paul starts here by encouraging us to imitate God in everything that we do and to be people of the light, to live in the light because now we have his light in us and, and really discourages us to, to live a life, to, to get away from sin, to get, to get away from those things that entangle us and drag us down and cause us to stumble in our life. He talks about uh, you know, making right choices and staying away from wrong choices in life, staying away from sexual immorality. He talks about greed, talks about foolish talk. I think foolish talk is probably one of the, the biggest things that we struggle with as a culture and as a people, even in the church, you know, I mean, just sometimes we can get so caught up in just things that, that are foolish, that, that aren't edifying ourselves, they're not edifying other people, and, and it can be easy to do because it's so prevalent in life. But Paul clearly lays out the consequences in Scripture for this kind of a lifestyle. And, and I believe all of us would probably agree unanimously that the types of things that Paul is talking about here are wrong. You know, these, these are sinful things. These are the types of things that if we've given our life to Jesus that we shouldn't be participating in. But the other reality is we all sin. We all mess up, right? We all fall short of the glory of God. Scripture tells us that. That's why we need a Savior. That's why last week we celebrated the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can have a relationship with God and we can repent and we can have forgiveness of our sins. But what Paul tells us is that when we do sin, when we are messing up, when we are making mistakes, to not be fooled into making excuses for our sin. Now, if you're bold enough, you can raise your hand. I'll raise mine. Anyone ever made an excuse for your sin? Anyone ever just said, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. Not as bad as I was last year at this point. I'm growing in the Lord a little bit here. Or, you know, I, I mean, I, I could be doing something worse with my time. This isn't helping me or my family, but, you know, I could, you know, I could be, do something, be, be doing something that's even worse than what I'm doing right now. We can make excuses, but at the end of the day, here's the thing about sin. And this is, this is a hard reality about sin. Sin is always a choice. I got quiet. Sin is always a choice. And here's the other reality about, thin, about sin. No one else can make you sin but you. No one else can make you sin but you. So, if your friend gets you mad, your boss gets you mad... I know your wife or kids or husband never get you mad, so we'll stay away from that analogy. But if someone gets you mad, you know, some people, have, everybody's got different temperaments, you know? Some, you know? some people, we like to stuff it, you know? And then the volcano comes out, right? And you explode and then you sin. Well, guess what? It wasn't all those people that made you mad that caused you to sin. You still chose to erupt, right? You know? If someone is going through a stressful time and their way of blowing off steam is to go out and be reckless in some area of their life, guess who chose that? You know, if we can't control our tongue and, and, and we gossip or we talk about other people, guess who caused you to do that? You did. We make a choice when we sin. So Paul is telling us here not to excuse away our sin, that we need to take ownership for it. Don't, don't be fooled into making excuses because at the end of the day, the only person that can sin is us. We're the only one that chooses that. It's not what other people do to us. What do they say? You know, life is really, um, you know, life really is, well, how's the expression go? 90%, uh, 10 percent what happens and 90 percent how you respond to it. And that really is, that's what we can control. We can't control what happens to us. We can't control when someone hurts us. We can't control uh, bad things that happen in life a lot of times. Uh, but we can control bad decisions. We can decide if we choose to sin and do something that's, that's unscriptural. We make those choices. So Paul tells us that, hey, once you are full of darkness, well, we're full of darkness before we make Jesus the Lord and Savior of our life. 
You know, once we, once we make Jesus the Lord and Savior of our life and then we're baptized, the, the Bible talks about going down in the, the, bap, the waters of the baptism, being raised a new life in Christ. We become a new person. So he says, now you once were children of darkness, but now you are children of the light. And so act like people of the light. He tells us to determine what pleases God and he tells us not to participate in the evil of the world. Look with me again at, at verse 15. It says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. To be careful how you live literally means that we need to look out in front of us. You know, if you're, if you're driving, again, let's use some driving analogies. When you drive down the road, where do you look? Where? Ahead. How far ahead of you do you look? I'm going to become a driving class inspector after this class. <laughs> Struck. Do you, look, do you look 10 feet in front of your car? Have you ever taught a kid how to drive? Oh, man, that's frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> you ever taught a kid how to drive? And you ever notice when they first start driving a lot of times, you're doing this all over the place, and you're getting seasick in that pad? Why? Because they're looking right in front of the car. You can't drive a straight. Have you ever tried? Everybody's going to go home and get pulled over on the way home. Everybody's going to be trying this. I just know it. You're going to go home and be looking like 10 feet in front of the car. You're going to be going all over the place. You have to look down the road a few hundred yards. You know, that helps you to also make sure you don't hit deer and things like that running uh, across the field. But when you look right in front of you, it's hard to drive a straight line. If you've never tried it, try it on the way home. We'll see how many, uh, how many uh, sheriff's deputies we can keep busy. And uh, just tell them you're practicing the sermon, okay? And... Um, <laughs> But if you, you have to look out farther to drive a straight line. You have to look out. So Paul tells us to be careful how you live. Literally to look out in front of your life and, and where you're going. To, to pay attention where you're, where, you're, where you're driving. Or as we walk through life, to pay attention where we're walking each and every day. You know, if you're out in your yard... And, uh, you know, we've got a couple acres in the country and my yard is uneven in a lot of areas. If I'm not watching where I'm going, there's some areas I could probably roll my ankle in my yard or sprain my knee if I'm not paying attention to where I'm going and what's coming up in front of me. Or to look out where you're going, if you have a dog and you're a pet owner and you don't like to clean up dog poop during the winter months, <laughs> then this verse takes on a whole new meaning to looking to where you're going in your yard. So, uh, you know, a lot of times after the snow melts and you're a dog owner, uh, I like to call them landmines. And there are landmines all over uh, the yard. And so you have to be careful where you are walking. And so that's a great visual for this passage. Paul is telling us to look out for the landmines in life, to look where you're going, to pay attention what you're doing with your lives so you don't step in it. So you don't play in it. So you don't make a mess of your life. So Paul tells us not to live like fools. You know, it is never fun to step into a landmine that a dog has left. Uh, I don't even like to drive through them when I'm cutting grass. Uh, because then the rest of the time, all you do when you turn the right way and the wind hits it, you smell dog poop the whole time you're cutting the yard. But when you got to take dog poop off a tennis shoe, guess what? It takes time. Right? Yeah, look at all everybody. You know what I'm talking about. We've all stepped in dog poop, probably. If you haven't, you're amazing. You're just, you're amazing. You know, we've probably all stepped in dog poop in life. Now, can we get the dog poop off the bottom of a shoe? Yeah, yeah. yeah, but guess what? You're out there in the yard. At least I am, like, sitting down in the grass. I got a little stick. You're trying to get all the little, all the little grooves out. Then you got to get the hose out. Then your shoe's wet. And you got to let it dry for two days. And you can get your shoe clean, but it takes a lot of time. And that's what Paul's telling us here in life. We can, we can clean up our life. We can clean up the messes from our life when we decide to go play in the landmines. But he's telling us not to do that, to, to stay away from that, to stay away from these types of things. He tells us not to live like fools, but to live like the wise. Only a fool decides to run through a yard after the snow has melted and not pay attention to where you're running, to where you're walking, to where you're stepping, because you end up making a mess of your life. And when you make a mess of your life, your life begins to stink. A wise person says, no, I think I'm going to pass on that. I'm not going to go do this. I'm not going to go walk through the landmines in the yard. We make better decisions than that. 
We keep our eyes open. Look to Scripture. God, what should I do? How should I live my life? Scripture tells us that fools have no understanding of God and his ways, but those that are wise look to God and his ways and what he has for them. You know, the older that you get in life, I know the older I get in life, like I said, I'm, I'm 45 years old. There's times where you look back on life and some of your regerts <laughs> and wish that you could get some of that time back. Has anyone ever had that? I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think if you stay there, that's probably a bad thing. But I don't think there's anything bad. You know, those that, that, that don't remember history, they're doomed to repeat it. I think sometimes it's important and good to go back and look at some things and go, you know what, I need to be careful with my time going forward. I can't change the past, but I can change the future. And sometimes, you know, we can learn just as much by the bad things that happen to us than from the good things that happen to us, right? If we use them as learning experiences for our life. And so sometimes it's important to do that. But as the older we get, we begin to look at the time that we have left and we begin to evaluate what truly is important in life. What, is, what are the things that, that, that you value? What are the things that, um, that, you know, that you need to do? What are the ways that you need to be uh, spending time? How do, you, how do you really worry about the way other people perceive you? Or are you more content to live your life the way that God has called you? to live your life. Another thing, church, is that we live in dangerous times. If you think about the time frame and history that we're, we're looking in right now, where we really can't afford to be careless, you know, with our time and what we do with our time. There's really too much at stake. I would say really culturally speaking right now, um, you know, we've not only hit the guardrail or hit the painted line, but we're kind of dangerously close, if not already going into the ditch culturally in a lot of areas in life. We're truly living in a time right now where evil's being called good and good is being called evil. There's a lot of things that we need to pay attention. So it's so important for us as the church, capital, church, capital C church in the world today, and, and I guess even this local expression of the body of Christ for the church of God to pay attention and to have healthy boundaries and, and have healthy barriers because there's going to come a time, and I keep saying it all the time, we're going to have to make a decision. Do we stand on the Word of God or do we not stand on the Word of God? Do we, do we bow down to things that culture are saying th that we should do or we should be involved in? Or do we stand on the Word of God and what God tells us in His Word? Even in the church, there's a lot of people that are cherry-picking out of Scripture what they want to believe and what they don't want to believe. You know, the reality, there's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of pastors preaching uh, a lot of things from, from the pulpit that aren't scriptural as well. You know, we have to decide, do we believe the Word of God or do we not believe the Word of God? Either the, the Bible is true and it is God's spoken Word or it's not. And when we cherry pick, we're making the decision that we really don't believe. We can say that it's God's word, but our lifestyle, our actions don't match it up. So we need to decide, is it the word of God? Is it an absolute authority for our life or not? See, the Bible is truth or it's not. Unfortunately, moral relativism has taken hold in our culture. And what's true for me might not be true for you. And well, but I, our feelings, oh, <laughs> feelings. Everything's all about feelings. I don't feel like that's a good thing, or I don't feel like doing that. Oh, I'm not going to go there. All right. <laughs> feelings. I don't know about you, but my feelings have misled me a lot in life. All right? It's not about feelings. There's a lot of times I, you know, I woke up this morning and I was tired. I didn't feel like getting out of bed. It'd be kind of weird right now if I wasn't here and you were all sitting there. So feelings are, you know, we can't be moved by our feelings, okay? Sometimes, I mean, God gives us emotions and feelings and all those things are good. And, uh, but we can't live life on an absolute standard of authority based upon feelings. That's a terrible foundation for our life. All right, verse 17, we got to keep moving. 
Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So this verse is telling us to pay attention, to not deceive ourselves, to take ownership, again, for our decisions and our choices, to know what God would have us do with our life. You know, we know a lot of times when we're playing with fire. We know when we're getting to the edge of an area in our life. And once we've had near misses in our life, we know it. And that's a time for us to, to wake up. You know, most of the time we know when we're playing on the edge of the road. Most of the time we know when we're right on the edge of a disaster in our life. It doesn't oftentimes sneak up on us. Usually we know when we've been flirting with disaster for a while in our life. Verse 18 says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't need to dig into, you know, a bunch of cliff notes in the Bible. What is, what is Paul talking about here? I don't know. No, we do. He says not to be drunk, but to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in our life, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He tells us to stay away from drunkenness. He tells us to stay away from being drunk with wine. And that would include beer too, okay? Not just wine. He's not, he's not saying that one you can get drunk with and one you can't. That's not what he's saying. He's saying stay away from a lifestyle of drunkenness. You know, oftentimes in my 23 years of being a pastor, I've had people ask me, you know, what do you think about drinking? What does the, the Bible say about drinking? Well, first of all, I want to say this. Don't make a guardrail in your life based upon my thoughts on it or anyone else's thoughts. That's the first thing. Look to Scripture for what God has to say about this area, because that's a pretty important area for a lot of people to establish a guardrail in their life is around the area of, uh, of alcohol. And sometimes God will lead different people different ways when it kind of comes to a gray area like this, because you'll have some people say drinking's not bad, and you'll have some people say, oh, you can't have a drink or you're going to go to hell. That's not in the scriptures anywhere. You can, you know, I'm open if you can show me that, to show me that, but I've never found that in scripture. Nowhere in scripture does it say that drinking alcohol is a sin. That's one thing that I see uh, in scripture. It doesn't say that. But this is what it always does say. Remain to stay away from drunkenness. To not be drunk. To be of sound mind. To be of sober judgment. And oftentimes in areas like this, God will give different people different convictions because there are some people that can't just have a drink because one drink turns into six drinks and turns into 12 drinks and it turns into drunkenness. And there are other people that can have a drink and they're just fine. And so the Bible says to remain uh, from being drunk, to not, to not be drunk, to not be drunk with wine, to not give in to that kind of a lifestyle because that leads to all kinds of other things. Alcoholism has destroyed families, many families, my, my family included. I had an aunt that passed away due to alcoholism. I've, I've known people that have, have drank themselves to death. I know family members that have had car accidents and loved ones have, have, have passed away due to, due to drunkenness. So alcohol can destroy families. But Paul points out basically what he's saying here. If you get drunk, you've hit a guardrail in your life. You know, that's a guardrail. So if, if you're okay and, and you feel like God says it's okay for you to have a drink, then make sure you're not getting drunk, right? And for other people... You can't have a drink at all because once you have one, you may as well just have 12. Right? right. Close down the bar, someone said. <laughs> you go to have one, you're closing down the bar. That can happen in life. So we need to have guardrails in our life. You know, another reason Paul talks about drunkenness here is uh, because one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And guess what? When a person gets drunk, do you have any self-control? Everybody's like, I have no idea because nobody here has ever been drunk before, right? Nobody went to college or went to high school, farm fields. You know, we've been there before. A lot of people, if I, I'm not going to make anyone raise their hands. But if you hit that, if you hit that guardrail, you know, if, if, if you're drunk, you've hit that guardrail and you've lost the fruits of the Spirit, self-control, and oftentimes a lot of the other fruits of the Spirit aren't operating in our lives either if we do something like that. We're not going to be loving. We're not going to be joyful. We're not going to have peace. We're not going to have patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, gentleness. You know, none of those things are operating in our life if we're drunk with alcohol. So Paul's saying, don't be drunk. Don't give yourself over to where all this other foolishness and things and bad decisions can happen in your life. So again, that's not, I'm not saying I'm, 
for you having alcohol, and I'm not saying I'm for you not having alcohol. That's, that's, that's not my decision to make. That's a, that's a boundary for you to set up with God. But again, some people can have a drink and some people can't have a drink. You need to know what that guardrail is in your life. Because alcohol can ruin a life. And in some versions of, of the Bible says it can lead to debauchery. You know, extreme indulgences in life lead to a loss of self-control. So, and not just alcohol, it can be lust, it can be greed, it can be food, it can be materialism, it can be anger. Do you see what I'm saying? Paul could have put any, any of those in there, all those areas of our life, we need to make sure that we follow what God's word says. All right, let's finish that verse 18 and we're going to wrap up with this. All right, so, so don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Paul's really clear with that. Uh, uh, I, I had one of my great friends who, who passed away about five years ago now. He lost a great job, a pension, a marriage, his family, all over alcohol. Thankfully, God got a hold of his life and gave his life to the Lord. And, and there's, he preached to everybody he came in contact with. We'd be on a turkey hunting trip out in the Black Hills of South Dakota and decide to actually shower one night so we didn't stink and actually look like human beings. We'd go into town and we'd have something to go have something to eat instead of having to cook something at camp. And we'd be at the table ordering food. And we're like, where's Dave at? And he hadn't passed the second table. He's talking to someone about Jesus, you know, in, in, in the middle of the Black Hills in South Dakota. And, you know, he talk about a life that was radically changed when God got a hold of him. So verse 18, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the question we have to answer is, what do we allow to influence our lives? Do we fill our lives with God? Do we allow the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and our life? Or do we allow other things to influence our behavior? Do we allow other things in the world to influence our decisions? You know, as God's people, if we give our life to Jesus, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to to influence our lives, amen? When we give our life to Jesus, we ask the Holy Spirit to come and to live on the inside of us. And the same power it says in Scripture that raised Jesus from the dead lives and dwells inside us, church. Yeah. See, we don't plan to mess up our lives each and every day any more than we plan to get up and go mess up our car. Have you ever woke up and said, let's see how many dents and scratches I can put on this thing today? Sometimes when we were, nah, I'm not going to go there. I was going to say when we were first early married before I taught my wife to park way out in the parking lot, sometimes she'd come back from the grocery store and I thought it was a contest. How many door dings can you get at the grocery store? I mean, I don't know what it is about grocery store parking lots, but you always come home with a bag of groceries and a ding in a car door. But messing up our car and messing up our life is not something that we wake up each and every day planning to do. We never wake up in the morning and say, which guardrails can I hit in my life today? See, nobody ever plans to end up in debt or in financial ruin and declaring bankruptcy. Nobody ever ha plans to have a marriage that doesn't work out. I've never counseled a couple yet that when they sat in my office and we did marriage counseling and said, hey, I'm in it for five years. <laughs> eh, I might want to trade her in for a new model after that. Never had a couple sit down in my office and plan for a marriage not to work out. I've never met someone that said that they planned to have an affair on their spouse. To fall in love with bad habits and character traits in our life that we just kind of keep doing over and over and over again that we can't seem to break out of the cycle. I've never met anyone that said, hey, my goal in life was to be addicted to something. Whatever that is, again, it can be money, pornography, whatever it is, power. See, establishing good guardrails in our life is going to help us to not do these types of things, to not make decisions that will cause us to have some of life's greatest regrets. See, guardrails in our life, on the side of the road, are designed to direct us. They're there to protect us, to help us, to show us where the bend of the road is. And when we establish healthy guardrails in our life, I really think it allows us to hear God's voice clearer as well 
when we get close to those areas, to, 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 to heed the nudging of the Spirit when we begin to move closer to the side of the road and into the shoulder before we ever hit a guardrail. The Holy Spirit's there going, hey, you're getting off track. Maybe you've experienced that in life and you can make that correction before you hit that guardrail. So in the coming weeks, we're going to take a look at just different areas of life. Again, I think it's going to be four or five weeks who knows, maybe we'll add a couple of things and maybe we won't because there's so many different areas in life that we need to have these healthy boundaries. And so as we close today and as we go through the week, I want us all to ask ourselves one question. Everybody that's here, but who's watching online, you're going to be back next week for this. Ask yourself this question. What areas of my life do I have some guardrails in? What areas of my life do I need to strengthen some guardrails? What areas of my life do I maybe not have any guardrails at all? I guess this is more than one question. And what areas in my life right now am I in a danger zone already? Or maybe I'm on the side of the road or maybe even part way down the ditch. What areas of my life do I need some healthy biblical guardrails? And ask ourselves that question and just think about that in the next like I said, four or five weeks as we go through the series, evaluate life. Because all these things are talking about living a life according to Scripture, the way God wants us to, to live, to be able to be a conduit of his love and grace, to, to share Jesus with other people, and to live a life that's going to glorify him. All right, let's stand. We're going to close in prayer. Again, we're going to have the, a class right now for anyone who is newer to the church. If you didn't sign up and you decide you want to come to that today, just uh, invite you back. We'll have enough food. Even if I have to give up my food, I'd rather have you come uh, so you can be part of that. Uh, but we should have plenty of food. And so if you want to come and be part of the, uh, the, just the class for people that are newer to the church and just learn more, we would love to have you join us uh, for that. We do ask you to come to this class before the membership class. Uh, it just gives you a, a good chance to understand who the church is and what God has called us to do. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you. And, Lord, we just thank you for this time, God. We're thankful that your word has, has, has just given us healthy boundaries on how to live a life for you and, and just love that imagery of, of a guardrail, a protection area to keep us from going off the road and getting involved in things that are destructive for us. And so, God, help us in the, in the coming weeks to look at our life, to evaluate our life, where we have good guardrails, where we, need to, where we need to strengthen those areas of our life that we need to set up a barrier of protection that we haven't. And so, God, we ask that you to help us to do this so that we can, we can live lives that honor you, that glorify you, that we, can, that, we can, that we can attempt to live a life free from sin. And when we do sin and we mess up, it's not because we're just so wanting and willingly wanting to live a life like that, but it's because we mess up, God, and then we can come to you and you're gracious and you're mercy and you forgive us. God, just pray for your blessing upon the church today as we go forth. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, God bless you. Go in peace. Have a great week. Hope to see you Sunday. Otherwise, next Wednesday or next, Wednesday or next Sunday.